for the Investing News Network from the MJ Biz International show in Toronto. Uh, I'm here with Alexander Curley, the head of insights with Prohibition Partners. Alexander, thank you so much for your time. Hi, thank you. Great to be here. So, Alexander, you had a uh, talk this morning about the international cannabis market. Can you tell me a little bit about, in terms of a global overview, how we're doing in, uh, in regards to legalization? Canada, obviously, a market that's been put into focus for sure, the U.S., as well as the pursuit for legalization continues. But on a grand scheme of things, how would you categorize the state of legalization across the world? I'd say it's still actually in its infancy. Obviously, what we're seeing is a growing number of company, countries are legalizing cannabis for medicinal purposes. We're starting to see in Europe some that are becoming more open to the idea of legalizing recreational cannabis. And Luxembourg is currently bidding to be Europe's first country to fully legalize the drug. Um, in other regions around the world, we're seeing a lot of promise coming out of Africa. South Africa is set to legalize. They've decriminalized at the moment and are looking to put through the paperwork by next year to have a legal market in place there. Um, and then also eyes are on New Zealand at the moment as well with another 2020 legalization um, time schedule in place. Yeah, specifically about New Zealand and South Africa, I believe during your panel, you mentioned a bit of the spending power that, that is in these countries and some of these newer markets that are opening up. Can you talk about how important that will be in terms of the investments that some people are making regarding companies setting up locales or shops or production companies or whatnot and how quickly the adoption rate can increase? Sure. I think there's actually a number of factors to think about here. The fact that they're both English-speaking countries as well will be a huge bonus for established players coming from the North American market. Um, in terms of how that market might open up, again, being developed countries, there's not so many people living below the poverty line, so affordability is there if people want to purchase recreational cannabis when that becomes legal. Um, in terms of medicinal cannabis, there's a fairly good health system in operation in both countries, so accessibility should be there, um, assuming that the governments have put in place the, the supply and the, the procedures that are necessary to get a prescription and then obtain the, the medicinal cannabis. Um, and all of that will be factors that will help to ensure growth within these markets. You mentioned that you still categorize the whole global industry as very much in its infancy, but we've seen how quickly things can pick up in the cannabis industry overall. Uh, right now in North America, even though uh, there's been a lot of projections about the total size value and those are still very healthy projections, the investment sector has cooled down a bit with a, a bit of a tough summer for a lot of companies that are seeing maybe a bit of a uh, down period or maybe some down reporting numbers. Is this a chance, do you think, for the global markets to step in a little bit more and start presenting themselves as an area of growth for investors maybe looking to expand their portfolios? Absolutely. And I think with legalization happening across Europe and Africa, Asia and Oceania, there's definitely opportunities for established players to expand their footprint. In fact, we've seen a number of joint ventures across Europe. We've seen um, licenses being obtained by North American companies. There's still a lot of investment, especially going into like Italy and the hemp market, for example. Um, so there's definitely huge opportunities. But one thing that could be holding back with um, companies, for example, wanting to launch on international stock exchanges. I know that in the UK, for example, the Proceeds of Crime Act, POCA, is putting a bit of a, a block on companies launching on stock exchanges. So in terms of sort of having those newer companies launching out of Europe, there's going to be some issues there. Whereas obviously in the North American market, you've got these companies who are already out there practicing, working in the cannabis industry and who are listed and have their investors. So that's another consideration as well. Um, about the UK, you mentioned there's a rising interest in this market. Uh, you mentioned that the UK has the chance to unlock the EU cannabis program. Can you talk a little bit about what you meant by that during your panel and sort of the role, how important is the role that the UK is playing right now in terms of the European cannabis market? It's actually Luxembourg that could unlock the European market. So Luxembourg is hoping to become the first European country to legalize recreational and medicinal cannabis. Um, Obviously, once one European country goes, I think we might start to see a bit of a domino effect, much the same way as you've seen that in North America as well, actually. Um, the UK is an interesting um, market. Obviously, I'm, I'm British. Um, 
And but I'm still a little bit disappointed with how the UK market is evolving at the moment. It's still very slow. Um, there was a lot of pressure on the government last year to legalise medicinal cannabis. Um, poorly children, such as um, Billy Caldwell, Alfie Dingle. They were used in the media to demonstrate the need for medicinal cannabis and the government pretty much bowed to that public pressure to legalise. But there was nothing else in place to make medicinal cannabis happen. So Carly Barton, who was the first uh, patient to get a prescription for cannabis in the UK, couldn't legally obtain cannabis in the UK despite the fact that she was holding prescription. Um, we've seen similar stories in Ireland as well. Um, obviously, sick children does a lot to help sway the government to change laws. Um, but it's really just paying a little bit of lip service unless all of the processes and the suppliers in place to actually ensure that the prescriptions are fulfilled for those patients. Another market that's uh, getting a lot of interest is the Australian cannabis market, a complicated market in terms of its current landscape, but one that has already seen some investment from Canadian players and other established partners in the, in the cannabis industry as a whole. Can you give a quick overview of, of how you evaluate that market right now and sort of what are the things to follow moving forward? Sure. I find the Australian market really interesting. Patient numbers have nearly trebled since last year. I think the prescriptions now are over the 3,000 mark. Um, one of the things that Australia did really well is they made sure that they had a system in place that was going to facilitate those prescriptions being written and obtained. And I think it was in the state of Victoria, but I would need to check. The state said, we don't need to be involved. Let's treat medicinal cannabis like you would treat any other prescription drug. And if the doctor prescribes it, you get your prescription, you can go and obtain the drug. So what is very interesting with Australia is that the country is, is basically trying to get some of those stumbling blocks out of the way to ensure a smooth transition to incorporating medicinal cannabis onto the pharmacopoeia. Um, but the other thing that I find very interesting about Australia is that the companies in Australia very much see that they have an opportunity to come centre stage and they can really compete with the Canadian giants. Um, they can produce cannabis cheaper and they have the climate, whereas obviously in Canada there's the, the expense of greenhouses. Um, but whether they're able to produce the cannabis at the quality that's required um, it will be that will be something that they will need to obviously work on I don't think that can necessarily be done with an outdoor grow uh, so therefore that might have an impact on on their price competitivity competitiveness even um, but it's definitely something that I I am watching eagerly in Australia to see there's there's a number of companies that are, are, are really ramping up efforts to to produce and uh, develop the uh, the market Alexander, obviously you've talked a lot about the global market in general, but tell me a little bit about what your day-to-day -day looks like with Prohibition Partners and what you guys are doing to stay up to date with the cannabis industry as a whole. Sure, gosh, it's an industry that's moving really fast as well. Um, so at Prohibition Partners, we launch uh, our free regional reports that people are very familiar with. Um, we have a, a team that are working very hard to gather all the data that we can um, so that we can, we're actually building out a subscription-based platform, which we're looking forward to launching later this year. Um, we have our people on the ground in markets. We're leveraging our network so that we can talk to people to understand how the cost per gram of cannabis is changing. You know, what's the, the impact of a supply bottleneck on, on the farmer prices? Um, and then tracking the news. Um, obviously, there is so much news. And understanding what's most important stories. We produce our weekly newsletter um, and... Another key part of my role, obviously, is market sizing and trying to understand what the market potential could be. We find that as more data comes available, our methodologies change and adjust. Um, it's a really interesting industry in that, obviously, nothing stays the same. So at the point that we are launching a report, literally, it could be the day that we're going to press and another country will have legalised or decriminalised and we need to update that um, before we can publish. Sometimes you just don't know that that's going to happen. Um, the Marriott Oceana Islands was one example uh, when we were about to launch the Oceana report. Um, so day to day, there's a huge amount of data gathering. There's a lot of data cleaning as well. Um, when we find a data source such as the UNODC, on first glances, it might look like it's a clean data source. You can look at your prevalence rates of cannabis around the world, but then you actually realize that that data has been collated through different research methodologies. Um, the most recently available data could be 2004 in one country and 2016 in another country. So we're constantly trying to rationalize and fill in the blanks where, where we have to. Um, so 
we've yet to find a complete data set. So a lot of our day-to-day -day time spent just working our networks, speaking to people and, and crawling the web to, to fill in the blanks to, to the data. Well, Alexandra, thank you so much for your time today and thank you for all your information. From the Investing News Network, I'm Brian McGovern here at the NJBiz International Event in Toronto.